morning and welcome to worship today. Let's, let's open with prayer. Loving God, we thank you for that as those two people walked along the Emmaus Road and your son Jesus spoke to them, that their eyes were opened and they understood. Lord, we come with open minds, ready to be filled with what you have to say to us. So Lord, use us in this time uh, and also use us in the time ahead during this week that we might reflect on your glory and your opening up of your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our reading today is from Luke chapter 13 and that's verse 6 to 9 and Ben's going to bring that to us. Good morning and praise God for today and uh, for having Russell along. Uh, we just thank the Lord for him. Also, I encourage you to pray for Johnson as he travels halfway across the world to visit his family over there. Uh, also, pray for the conflict over seas in uh, Russia and Ukraine and just put them in your prayers and the leaders of these two countries in your prayers that uh, wisdom will prevail. So, as Russell mentioned, uh, we'll read from Luke 13, uh, 6 to 9. Then he told this parable. A man, <coughs> a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilise it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Praise God, this is the word of the Lord and uh, we'll get Russell back to uh, see what the Lord's put on his heart for us this week. Amen. Thanks, Ben. As we approach Easter, it is a special time of the year for Christians and those who follow Jesus. But over the world there are different reactions to Jesus Christ, actions of, um, of indifference, of antagonism and of, of devotion. There are different people and different people have different opinions of Jesus Christ. But one thing that seems to be agree, people seem to be in agreement about is that Jesus was a great teacher. And I've often thought about that and people, everybody will agree with that and yet it's interesting, I've never sat down until recently to think, well why was he a great teacher? What made him a good teacher? And as a person who taught for many years I'm surprised that I never, never dawned on me to look. But when I look at Jesus as a teacher, first of all, the thing that impresses me is that he knew what he was talking about. He was comfortable in his skin. He wasn't threatened by people. He knew who he was. He knew what his mission was. And he knew um, where he was going. The second thing was he talked to his audience. He understood who the people were who were coming to him. Rabbi Zechariah said that behind every question, there is a questioner. And Jesus not only looked to what they had to challenge him or ask him about, he looked to who they were and he answered them accordingly. Some were seekers and he answered them very well. Some were desperately trying to find the truth. And Jesus was fairly forthright or fairly um, clear in presenting that. Some were accusers, came to him with a question. And of course he would often bounce a question back off them to see what they were. Some tried to mock him or saw him as a form of amusement. Herod, for example, spent all night with Jesus trying to get him to talk and he said nothing. Some people came because they wanted what they could get out of him. But he understood what the people were, who the people were that came to him. And that was what made him a great teacher. He didn't just talk generally to people, he spoke to them at their point of need. The other thing about Jesus was he encouraged inquiry. It's interesting, I, I 
heard the other day somebody saying about talking about an expert talking about teaching and he said the trouble with teaching is too many teachers are giving the kids the answers before they ask the question. Too many kids give too many teachers give the kids the answers before they ask the question. And it's interesting, isn't it? Jesus had a way of developing an inquiring mind in the people who listened to him. So in a way, he was not always clear in what he said. <laughs> that sounds a bit, um, a bit out there, but Jesus was fairly uh, confusing sometimes in the things that he said. A bit like my mother, I used to uh, sometimes go to her when I was a, a boy and I'd say, how do you spell this, Mum? And she'd say, look it up in the dictionary. And I thought, well... I don't want to look it up in the dictionary because I came to you to ask you and, and how do I know how to spell it if I can't find it? And, but Jesus had that knack of making people go away thinking, what was that all about? <laughs> what was that all about? And so one of two things would happen. You would either question what Jesus was saying and try to work it out or you would ignore it and say it was too hard. And if you thought it was too hard, you missed what it was about. But if you thought it through, you went, oh, that's right. That's what he's getting at. That's what he means. You know, sadly, I think today, us as ministers, sometimes we love to make something clear <laughs> and then we make a nice little three-point sermon so you take out a pre-digested package. So if you go away from this sermon being confused and saying, what was that about? I would have done a much better job. <laughs> and Jesus used two forms of... Um, Teaching. One was he would often answer a question with a question and make you think about why you'd asked the question in the first place. But one of his favourite ways was to tell stories or parables. And I want to concentrate on this parable this morning. Parables are interesting because what they do, Jesus did in teaching parables, he would engage in the familiar. He would talk about crops, he would talk about money, he would talk about things that people had an understanding of. So it wasn't too hard to follow. They seemed very simple stories. But they had a message to them. And they would, he would confront them and make them think about what they were to say. You know, I said once that uh, when, I used, well, when I used to teach, I used to say to my class in the first lesson, teachers, I can't teach. Teachers can't teach. They can only provide an environment for you to learn in. And the kids would look at me with a strange look and I'd say, what I mean is, if you're not prepared to learn anything from me and you refuse to learn anything from me, you render me helpless. I can't teach you. My teaching depends on your learning. And I think the people who listened to Jesus were the same. Some closed their hearts against him. But to those who opened their hearts and listened, they found the secrets of the scriptures. Jesus, he didn't even explain some of the characters in the Bible. For example, in the prodigal son, um, we assume that the father is God. Now, Jesus never says that. He leaves us to make the assumptions about who the characters represent. And the other characteristic about the parables is that sometimes they don't finish in a neat little story. They finish up in the air. You know, I think of novels. Novels are incredible, aren't they? You read a novel, it might be a spy novel or something, and everything's all haphazard until the last four pages, and everything gets tied up in a nice little bundle, and we can move on to the next thing we've got to do. And, you know, life's not like that, is it? When you think about it, there's no part in my life where I think, oh, yes, I've tied up everything for that part of my life. I can move on to the next chapter, because there are still parts missing and moving there. And Peter, often, the prodigal son is a classic... We don't know whether the prodigal went off again and had a wild fling. We don't know whether the older brother really forgave his son. And the reason I think that some of those things don't have an ending is that we are in the story. We are the ones in the story. So we're in the story and Jesus is asking you, where do you want to go from here? And this little story, it's an interesting one, it's a very short parable, gives those elements it doesn't tell us how things worked out. It leaves us for us to do. But let's have a look at this parable of the fig tree. First of all, there's figs and there's grapes. The fig tree was in amongst grapes. Now, I don't know about you, but I prefer figs to grapes. And uh, I always say a good wine is really a waste of good grapes. 
But that was opposite in those days, as it may be in some companies today. The great, the vineyard was seen as important. The vineyard was where the wine was, was the, the source of where the wine was produced. Figs grew everywhere. So people would walk along the streets or the roads and they'd, they'd just pick a, a fig off because there were trees by the side of the road. We have a, a little guava tree on the way home to my place and uh, often we'll stop and take a few guavas off the tree and nobody minds because it's a public tree. And there were public figs then. But vineyards were different. Grapes were tended and nurtured and looked after. And here in the middle of this vineyard is a fig tree. And so the fig tree had a place of incredible privilege. It was nurtured, it was looked after, it, was, it had all the privileges of the grapes. But the sad thing is, it was fruitless. And in the Old Testament, fruit, fruitfulness was symbolic of a godly life. So when Jesus tells this story, in some people's minds, they think, well, this tree is symbolic of someone that wasn't godly. It was fruitless, as I said. One, when we went to Townsville, we live in Townsville, we bought a house and, and in the back of that house was this beautiful big lychee tree and I love lychees and I was so excited and uh, anyway, we, we, for three years, this lychee tree produced beautiful, beautiful leaves <laughs> but not one fig, not one lychee I should say, not one lychee. And I spoke to a friend of mine who grew lychees and I said, you know, I've got a tree that's not producing anything. And he said to me, you're spoiling the tree. You're spoiling the tree. You give it too much water. Put it under a bit of stress and you will get your fruit. When you look at it, this fig tree in the middle of the grapevine was spoiled. It had a position of incredible privilege. And I think sometimes when you think about our situation, we live in a time of incredible privilege. But privilege implies responsibility. And the same with um, the Jews in that time. I'm sure that Jesus was implying this story that privilege implies responsibility. And when we have privilege, we can sit back and accept it. Or we can say, I have a position of responsibility to use that privilege for godly purposes. And things usually take about 18 months to, or two years to mature and, and bear fruit. And in that time, they will often bear two, maybe three, lots of figs in a season. If you have a look, this tree was three years old. So it had gone beyond its bearing date and was still doing nothing. And it implies, you know, it's the agony of, and you see this in people. Sometimes people have everything going their way and yet their life is fruitless. And this tree was fruitless as it was there in the middle of the vineyard. Then enter the two characters, a landowner and a caretaker. The landowner, and we often think, all right, who, who are they supposed to represent? And most people, myself included, will say, well, the landowner was, was God, the caretaker was Jesus. And in a way, we tend to go that way because one of them, the, care, the landowner, wants to chop the tree down, not prune it, chop it down at the roots, get it rid of it. It's no use, it's useless. But the caretaker says, no, let's nurture it. And sometimes we perceive God and Jesus in those two roles. Now, I believe that they were, God, they were meant to be those two people. But, but I think sometimes we split God and Jesus up. And we look as one as the, the judge and the other one as the, the saviour. And that's what they are. But those things are not as different as we think. Judgment and salvation, judgment and love often go together. If I had a daughter who was out um, being on drugs and having wild times, I would be very concerned. And I would be concerned because I love my daughter. But I would also be concerned because I have a standard that I expect her to live up to. If I didn't have a standard, I could still love my daughter and let her go out and do all those things. If I didn't love my daughter, I could have a... Can you see how the two set work together in a complementary way? We love our people. And God has this duality about him there. He loves his people, but he's a God of justice. And the God of justice, the justice side of him says, well, this tree has done nothing with all the privileges it's got. Let's get rid of it. 
But the caretaker comes in and says, let's give it one more chance. Let's give it one more chance. You know, Jesus was the one more chance that was sent to us. The one more chance. And so Jesus says, I'm going to do so. The, the caretaker says, I'm going to do something. Let me dig around and, and, and dig around the roots and let me fertilise it for a while. And if it doesn't produce by that time, well, so be it. And so the caretaker was happy with that. I want you to think about the two things that, that the landowner suggested. One was to dig around and the other one was to put manure on. Now, I'm not a big fan of manure, but the manure will nourish the tree. Digging around will loosen the soil. And so those two things will help the tree grow, will help the roots go down deep, will enable the tree to become nourished and able to do that. We live in a time where I feel that we can be overcome by circumstances. When you listen to the news, we get told that the cost of living is too high, we get told that people are going through emotional difficulties, we get told all these negative things. And sometimes those negative things can harden us so much that we don't put our roots down behind him anywhere else. We are bounded sometimes by circumstances that don't allow us to grow spiritually. And sometimes, and I hear Christians saying this, oh, it's terrible what's happening in the world. It's awful what's happening in the world. And it is awful what's happening in the world. But that has been going on for thousands of years. We are in no worse a state, in fact, we're in a better state than many people have been over the years. But we like to think that we can't, we allow ourselves to be, be hardened or limited by the hardened circumstances that are presented around us. And sometimes in that we don't realise that there is a Jesus. A Jesus who is prepared to dig around the roots, to loosen up the soil, to take us out of the landlocked sort of existence we're in and says, go ahead, dig your roots down deep and grow. And the other is nourishment. I don't know about you, but when those circumstances come, I find my relationship with Jesus goes very dry. And Jesus is saying, allow me to come. Allow me to come into your, not, your, your dry spirit and nurture you. We need a caretaker like Jesus. And just before he, the night before he died, he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And it's interesting, isn't it, that when you look at that vine and branches analogy, it's not unlike this one. What he's saying is that um, you can't bear fruit without me. And that's true. But the other side of that vine and branches analogy is that Jesus can't bear fruit without us. It's two of us working together to advance the kingdom. And when Jesus does that, we are reminded of the last bit that he says, or the land and the caretaker says, if it doesn't bear fruit, then chop it down. Then chop it down. You see, fruitfulness is expected. And sometimes when we talk about fruitfulness, we can get caught up in it. I grew up in a time where we were made to feel guilty if you didn't witness to people. I grew up in a church where you had to witness to everybody, you know, and bring people to Christ. And sometimes that expectation can become something that drags us down. It's like that hard soil around us that makes us fearful. But Jesus is saying, let your roots go deep. Keep yourself nourished and you will be fruitful. Fruitful in ways you may not even expect when somebody comes up and says, do you know I became a Christian because of you? Not because you went out of your way to witness to them, but because they saw the depth of faith that you had. They saw the nourishment that you had been given. And fruitfulness will happen when we dig into the spirit of Jesus. As I said, we don't know the outcome. We don't know the outcome. We don't know whether that tree bore fruit or whether it finished up meeting its end. And life's like that, isn't it? Life's like that a lot. When you get married, you don't know what the outcome's going to be. You don't know whether you're going to finish up happily married or whether you're going to finish up with a, a, a terrible divorce. When you have your children, you don't know whether they'll grow up to be 
absolute rebels or whether they'll be faithful servants. But what we can do is to know that if we put our faith in Jesus, then life will be much more fruitful than we would expect. And life is like that. It was like that for Jesus. Jesus spread the word, but not everybody believed it. It's like that for us. There will be disappointments. And I suppose what we call failures, but they're not failures. They're people who have not responded to the word. But the reality is there will come a time when the tree is cut down. So let yourself flourish. Go deep down and be encouraged to draw on the Saviour's care. That's what I believe this parable is telling us and that's the message I'd like to leave with you today. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for this very simple, simple story. A story that's commonplace. A story where people do gardening every day and dig around and try to make the tree grow. Where people put on fertiliser. But Lord, it's a story about us. We pray that we would take in the nourishment of what you have to give us and become fruitful and faithful servants in your name. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.